Lord's good. Turn to Luke 10 tonight. Luke 10. We're going to finish it up. Now, tonight, Mary and Martha, and I have a little bit of a trick question here. Which one are you? Which one are you? Well, I pray you're a little of both. If you're a lot of one or the other, maybe you need to listen in quickly. <laughs> Get focused. <laughs> yeah, we have this incredible story of these two <laughs> sisters that Jesus loved. Which are you? You see, some people, like Martha, are definitely too busy to sit at the feet of Jesus. They just got too much going on, too much to do. They have a tough time focusing in on worship. They worry too much about stuff. Tonight, as we dig in at verse 38 here in Luke 10, we'll finish up the chapter. I can tell you for a long, long, long time, and, and Connie would bear witness to this, I was a Martha Maximus. I was like maybe five Marthas all crammed together in one human being. Just like super Martha. Like, you know, it had SM on her, you know, her cape. It's one of those people that almost everything could interfere at times with sitting at the feet of Jesus. And so this is a special passage. Uh, for me, it's a reminder. I think for us, it's a reminder. And so would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this beautiful picture of these two sisters who obviously loved you, who were your friends. Oh, Lord, how we want to be your friends. And we're so grateful that you've chosen us and adopted us into the beloved. Lord, that you would uh, condescend to come to this earth and select us out of this world, Lord, we're, we're amazed by that. This family that also included Lazarus, this place that you always stopped at. Lord, when you came to Jerusalem, this was your place of refreshment. This is your place of fellowship. And we pray tonight that we would just learn and glean and grow, be encouraged and strengthened and built up. So grateful for your people to come out tonight and pray that you bless each one that's here with a special blessing. Fill us with your spirit and anoint us to receive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 38 here in Luke 10, and now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him to her house and she and her sister called Mary you also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted by much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? And therefore, tell her to help me. I mean, come on. I, I'm pulling my weight, hers too. I'm busy. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. You can probably throw a few more Marthas in there. Martha, 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 Martha. Martha. You are worried and troubled about many things. Doesn't that describe our lives? There's a lot to be worried and troubled about. When you really stop and think about it, I mean, there's substantive things that one could say, ah, this is what I'm concerned with. This is what I'm worried about. These are the things that occupy my mind. And very often, they would be really good things. And you could, you could throw name tags on them. Well, I'm worried about my job. I'm worried about taking care of my family. I'm worried about mowing the lawn. I'm worried that my dogs ran away. I'm just worried about my kids. I'm worried about school. I'm worried. I'm just worried. I'm concerned. And they're all legitimate concerns or things that I should actually occupy my time with. Martha, you're worried about and troubled about 
many things. But one thing is needed. One thing. A singular thing. One thing is actually needed. You're worried about a lot of things. You're concerned about a ton of things. And notice Jesus doesn't blast her for these things. doesn't say, like, your things don't matter. You know, he, didn't, he doesn't go so far as to say, oh, ye of little faith, stop worrying. You're worried about a lot of things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part. The one thing. The essential thing. The necessary thing, the, the, the secret medicine, if you will, to living a life that's blessed. To living a life that has less stress. Anybody want to live a life with less stress? Your secret's right here in this passage. It's in this passage. The one thing, she's chosen the good part which will not be taken away from her. Now, there's a couple of things before we get started and really dig into this passage I want you to notice. Jesus doesn't come out, doesn't really chastise Martha. It's not like there's a real huge issue here with her working. It is an attitude that's the problem. She's doing the right thing with the wrong motivation. She's doing the right thing with the wrong spirit. She's doing the right thing without having the right manner of living about her. She's got a heart that's a mess and a head that's thinking through things straight. She's got an issue, not with what she's doing, but how she's doing it. And so very often you're going to find it in your life. It's really not the stuff it's whether you've looked at that stuff correctly. And most importantly, that you've taken time to sit at the feet of Jesus. And so here in this passage, I had to start with me. Martha, double Martha. Holy Spirit, I think, kind of takes a little bit of a pause here because Jesus is on his way uh, into Jerusalem one more time. He's going to leave. He's going to come back. This is the last three, maybe four months of his life. This passage likely happened around the, the festival of the dedication of the, of the temple. And for those of you that, you know, love your history, 168 or so, Antiochus Epiphanes slaughters a pig in the temple and desecrates it. The temple is useless. And um, about three years later, Judas Maccabees comes in and cleanses the temple and, and relights the giant menorah, and that menorah used oil, olive oil specifically, and it was special oil that was blessed. And in the temple, there was only one flask of oil. That was enough, supposedly, for one night. And so as he poured that oil after cleansing the temple and making it so that uh, the temple could be used and the light would shine once again, uh, he poured that oil in, and it didn't last one night. It lasted eight nights. And so the festival of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication of lights is eight nights because the Lord supernaturally extended the light during that time that the temple was rededicated. So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem at about our Christmas time, about the time that Jesus' birth will later be celebrated. But it's the Feast of Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights, the Feast of Dedication. And so he comes into this, this city, and if you look at Jerusalem, this map's maybe a little hard to see, but when you travel into Jerusalem, the Temple Mount's almost dead in the middle of that. It's kind of that white box you can see outlined by red. But Bethany would be about a mile and a half away. It would be on the road heading towards Jericho, but down the, the canyon, and it would wrap around uh, behind the Mount of Olives, and, and there's not a whole lot of distance, less than 20 miles between there and the Dead Sea. And it's, a, it's kind of a, a way station, if you will, on the way into Jerusalem on the east side of the Mount of Olives. And as you travel there today, 
Uh, if you're up on the top of the Mount of Olives and you would see, looking back now, you'd see the Dome of the Rock Mosque and uh, you would have a very different view because it's completely covered uh, in Jewish graves and in, in tombstones and uh, the whole side of that, the western side of the Mount of Olives would be a place that's just a giant cemetery. But in Jesus' day, there's a small road that transected uh, that part of the Mount of Olives, or olive groves all over the Mount of Olives. And if you travel and you go to the, what is believed to be the Garden of Gethsemane, it's also along that road. It's, it's along the, what would now is called the Palm Sunday Road. And so there you would, you would find Jesus normally in the late afternoon. We find him out on the Mount of Olives all the time. But before he would get there, he actually came to his friend's house. Present day Bethany actually has a, a house that they call the house of Mary and Martha, and it really is about 2,000 years old, they believe. Um, so it was a place that Jesus rested. It was a place where Jesus knew that as he was going to go into the city, as he was going to go in and minister, uh, that he was going to take some persecution. He, he was going to be uh, beat up if that, if, 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 that was almost always the case. When he went, he poured himself out when he went to Jerusalem. Every single time he went to Jerusalem, he, he was poured out. He spent time teaching on the southern steps. Uh, he, he ministered in and around the Temple Mount, and then he would withdraw. He'd go back to the Mount of Olives. And sometimes we find him at this home because these were his friends. These were people that he knew, people that he loved. And there's several things we can draw from this passage. And one of them is, even Jesus needed friends. Sometimes we don't think, we think of Jesus as God. And very often we dehumanize Jesus. But Jesus was also fully man. He wept, he got tired, he was hungry. He got sweaty, he was, he was in need of refreshment. And this was a place where Jesus had come to be refreshed before he was going to go into the city of Jerusalem. And we can see what happens when you don't take time to sit at the feet of Jesus. You can actually kind of suck the joy out of the room. And, and you can be used at times to quench the spirit. On one side of the Mount of Olives was Jerusalem. On the other side was a road that led down to a little village called Tekoa. And Tekoa, if you remember your minor prophets, the prophet Amos was from that city, the gatherer of sycamore figs, you know, the guy that would wander around. And when you traveled to Israel, one of the things that you quickly notice is as you descend from Jerusalem, which sits at 25 to 2,800 feet, depending on which mountaintop you're sitting on, and you descend down some nearly 1,400 feet below sea level when you get to the Dead Sea, you're dropping down 4,000 feet and s several climate zones and a whole bunch of heat, and it is just a dry, dusty road to travel. And so Jesus has come up that way. He's come from the Jordan Valley, which is the end of the African Rift Valley, and as he travels up, he, he's, he's thinking, great, I'm going to get with my friends, and I'm going to enjoy a home-cooked meal. Now, for those of you that have traveled and you've been away from home, one of the things, you know, it doesn't matter how good restaurants are, after a while, like when we traveled, we just went, were in Israel just a few months ago, when you travel, we eat this is huge buffets every day. I mean, you can gain like 800 pounds. And, 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 you know, they're gigantic, and there's everything you can think of, and you're sitting there, and you're looking at it. But by the time you get done, if you ever, you like to the place, I don't want to ever see another falafel. You know, no more Mediterranean buffet. I'm just, I'm sick of that good, healthy food. I want some fried chicken. You want good, home-cooked fried chicken. And bring on the black-eyed peas and cornbread. <laughs> We're from the South, just saying, Okay. The family, we, that's Sunday afternoon. Ma's fried chicken, cornbread, black-eyed peas. You want something home-cooked. You, you want a fellowship. You want to stand in the kitchen and smell the smells and enjoy the fellowship that happens as family, as friends. You ever had one of those people in your family 
that all they do is complain about how much work they did to bless you? You know what I'm saying? It's not that big a blessing to hang out with people like that, is it? Jesus came for friendship and fellowship and a good home-cooked meal and to sit down with his, his friends and just relax and be refreshed. And what does he get? First words out of Martha's mouth, I've been working my fingers to the bone. I've been preparing this goat for weeks. You want it sliced thin? You see, sometimes we can do good things with the wrong heart. And so one side a sterile desert, on the other side Jerusalem, in the middle this family's home, Mary and Martha and their brother, their brother Lazarus. He'll spend the next time he comes into town, he'll be heading to Jerusalem to, to go to the cross. And as they gathered around and as they begin to speak and talk through these things, you, you, can, you have to kind of read a few things into this conversation to really see the depth of it. But you can kind of imagine... Uh, if you will, these two sisters. And, and they, they represent so very often what we would see as two things that are so opposite that they almost have to be mutually exclusive. And I want to say to you, I, I don't see it that way. I, I don't believe that that's the case. And I believe that there's, there's a place uh, in, in, in the world for, for the Johns who are dreamers and the Peters who are doers. I think it's the beauty of the church. Both types of people are necessary. But Jesus is going to focus in. And, and you see, Martha, she ha has chosen to serve, and Mary chose to sit. They, they both saw the same situation. They responded to it very differently. It wasn't that they responded differently. It was the heart with which Martha responded. It wasn't that she saw the work that needed to be done. It's how she viewed that work. And so as you think on these things, don't be too harsh on Martha, because the world definitely needs some Marthas, too. We generally find the Marys of the world kind of holed up in some corner with a book. They're, they're the contemplative types. They're the ones that have a tendency uh, to always look at things from that particular side. And that's a wonderful, wonderful characteristic. But I think Jesus is really trying to make a point because I can tell you that, that us doers get under the skin of sitters. And sitters get under the skin of us doers. So it, it, it does take some learning to see both sides with that same spirit, that spirit that, that binds us together and makes us both useful. I don't believe, like I said, it is an either or message. I believe that it absolutely is a beautiful picture. And as Martha chose her way and Mary chose her way, I think when you look at what they're doing, it kind of gives you a sense of the beauty, really, of how the body of Christ is supposed to function. You, you have those who are pragmatists. I'm a pragmatist. I'm one of those people I look at things in a very orderly, non-chaotic, pretty much linear fashion, and I work through the possibilities, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, there's the answer. You need those kind of people. But I can tell you where people like me get really messed up is I can get so linear and so direct and so goal-oriented that I will just keep going right over the top of people. That's my natural tendency. I, I have to stop to say, what is the better thing? What's the one thing? What's the ingredient, the, the secret ingredient here that needs to be added into this? And, and I'll tell you, worship and work can peacefully coexist, but you must be a worshiper. You must be a worshiper first. You've got to be somebody who's been sitting at the feet of Jesus in order to have your work have any meaning within the church whatsoever. And when you think about that, there, there's always places to serve. There's always things to do. There, there's stuff constantly to be done. But if our attitudes are such that when we get done with whatever it is that we're doing, 
that the Lord has not been magnified. He's not been glorified. There, there's, no, there's no aspect of worship to it as a believer. Then we've missed the whole purpose for which we're here. We're not just here to get tasks done. We're here to preach the gospel with our lives. We're here to glorify the Lord with our very beings. We're, we're Jesus people. And so we have to sit at the feet of Jesus to be able to do that. And so worship needs to be at the heart of all that we do, all that we are. It needs to be the dimension with which we lead. You, you see, sometimes, and, and you probably all know somebody like this, sometimes you have very, very, very gifted people who are extremely ineffective in ministry because they're very, very gifted people, but they don't get along with very, very broken people. They, they can't love the unlovable. And it's usually because they have not sat at the feet of Jesus. They forget why they're even doing what they're doing. They just see it like I used to see things, very linearly. It's just like, that's the goal, that's the path, we'll go that way. In the meantime, all, of the, all the bodies that are in the way just kind of scatter. Worshippers definitely need to work hard but it's most important that we worship God. And I do believe the Lord here in this passage is very definitely putting an emphasis on that one dimension because it's easier to be like a Martha than it is like a Mary. It's easier, especially in our Western culture. In our culture here in L.A., it's easy to be a Martha because there's always stuff to do. It's very difficult at times to sit at the feet of Jesus. Interesting little fact for you. All kinds of different polls have been taken and questionnaires filled out. But there are two things in the life of most pastors that they will tell you are their two weaknesses. You want to take a guess what they are? Devotional life and prayer. Those two things, you have to be quiet before the Lord. You've got to sit at the feet of Jesus. To have a personal devotional life where you're receiving from the Spirit of God, you're sitting at the feet of Jesus and say, I just want to hear what you have to say, Lord. And I just want to talk back to you. That's what prayer is. I, I, I want to ask of you and talk with you and have you communicate in my life. And so it doesn't matter who you are. I think we're all prone to be more like Mary and less like Martha. Successful people are very much prone, and in fact so much so that they oftentimes feel like they really don't need to sit at the feet of Jesus. I'm too busy doing work. I've had to let a handful of church staff to find another way to take care of their family because they couldn't learn this lesson. They were good at what they were doing, but they were terrible at how they did it. The wake of chaos and hurt people, uh, those that were around them, that no, I mean, people that didn't even want to walk with the Lord anymore because they bumped into somebody doing a good job at something. We need to make sure that we're taking time to sit at the feet of Jesus. And there's a secret to this, and it's really found in a couple of very small words. It's a contrast between two believers, both who love the Lord that we see here, but notice here that one was occupied for Christ and the other was occupied with Christ. Those are two very different things. They can be joined together with the right heart, but you can be occupied for Christ and actually do things without a Christ-like heart and without a Christ-like attitude. You can just simply be busy. And we call that professional ministry. There are people who are professionals in ministry. They're very good at doing certain tasks and goals. They're occupied. They can be occupied simply for the Lord. But they're not occupied vertically with the Lord. They're occupied horizontally for the Lord. In other words, there's stuff to be done, but they're not occupied with the Lord. He's not their focus. He's not their goal. They're really not trying to hear his voice. They're simply trying to do some tasks and get some stuff done. Service, 
Service should never be a substitute for devotion to the Lord. When it becomes service ahead of devotion, then you lose the heart of Christ. You, you, you lose the purpose for which we even minister in the first place. And so service, work, should not be a substitute for devotion, which is our worship. Where we focus our worship, that, that's who our God is. And if you're focusing your worship on work, then your God's actually tasks. And that's where Martha was. She was saying, look, I worship my work. Uh, she was the world's first workaholic listed in Scripture. She worshiped what she did. And so that became most important. Here, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, has come into her home, and, and she's saying, look, I, you know, I got meat to slice. I mean, the pitas are not cooked yet. Somebody needs to go get some water. And nowhere in this passage do we find Jesus dissatisfied with anything in his surroundings. It's not like he's bossing everybody, you know, Jesus comes in, look, I'm king of kings, lord of lords, could you kind of take care of me? No matter what would have been put in front of Jesus, he would have been okay with it. If there was a right heart behind it. We need to have that vertical fellowship, which is our worship. Vertical fellowship is worship. Vertical fellowship. In other words, we can fellowship with each other. That's horizontal. But vertical fellowship, our, our close-knit communion with the Lord, that's our worship. That's where we want to be. We want to be sitting so that we can look up and see his face. And it doesn't mean that we can't perform tasks and do things in the kingdom and for the Lord and, and still worship at the same time. Of course we can do that. But if we're only seeking to accomplish tasks and we forget that vertical element that I'm doing this not so that I can gain God's approval, not so I can get the stuff done, but because I'm so occupied with Christ, I want to do these things. I, I still want to sit at his feet. I, Lord, I, I want to finish this task because I, I want to spend time with you. Not I want to finish this task so I can finish out my day so I don't have to spend time with you. Charles Wesley wrote one of his hymns. One of the stanzas of it says, Faithful to my Lord's commands, still I would choose the better part to serve with careful Martha's hands. And Mary's loving heart. You, know, you want to be careful with your hands. You, you want to let God use your hands, of course. But you want to have Mary's heart. Mary was feeding on the word of God. At that, at that sense, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I love this picture of her. You, you see, as, as Matthew would remind us there in chapter 4, Jesus speaking, he says, Look, man shall not live by bread alone. Look, man doesn't live by all the stuff that you do. Man doesn't live by the, the bread that you pull out of the oven, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so Jesus himself was saying, look, there's a place for eating. There's a place for food. There's a place for the stuff in your life. But the better part is the bread of life to feast on Jesus in that sense. Jeremiah 15 says, your words are found, and I ate them, and your words became a part uh, for me of joy. And a delight to my heart. The, the words of the Lord, when you sit at Jesus' feet, you, you get to take in things that you are going to miss if you don't sit at Jesus' feet. It's that simple. And too many Christians spend their whole existence as, as believers without taking time to sit at the feet of Jesus. One of the things that we fight in a church this size is becoming completely institutionalized. Because there's a lot of stuff that needs to get done to do church. You know, three services on Sunday morning, thousands of people coming and going and Sunday school classes and all this stuff and just the janitorial things and making sure the car, all that stuff could just occupy your time. At the end of the day, you could almost do it as a job. It'd be a Christian job. It'd be a ministry job. If you want to come, but it'd be a job. And yet the Lord wants us to sit at his feet and learn of him. One of the things that you all should know is our whole staff here goes through the Bible every year. Every year, we sit down and we read through the Bible. 
And we sit at Jesus' feet. We discuss the Word of God. We don't just sit around and teach each other. You know, so if you have that impression that we all sit around, you know, studying. And, no, we actually sit at the feet of Jesus. Challenge each other. Encourage each other. Strengthen each other. Build each other up. Because we need to do that. We need to sit at the feet of Jesus. 119th Psalm there in verse 103 and 104. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey in my mouth. Your precepts I get understanding. And therefore, I will hate every false way. The way that you learn to hate the false way, the way that you learn to discern what is the wrong way, is sitting at the feet of Jesus. You see the common thread? It's all sitting at the feet of Jesus. Sitting at the feet of Jesus enhances everything else that we do. It makes you more effective in your ministry. Uh, as I look around the room, looking at some of the staff here, it's like, uh, it, and this is one of those things that you can do. It becomes institutionalized. It becomes like a Martha world. And instead of praying about things, you just do your best. Instead of asking God for wisdom, you just go check the manual. Instead of sitting at the feet of Jesus, you're trying to do it in your own strength. And our arms of flesh don't sustain us for very long. We need to sit at the feet of Jesus. There are a few things I believe that are more damaging to the Christian life than trying to work for Christ without taking time to commune with Christ. I don't think there's, there are very few things that are more damaging to us. Because what happens if you just work for him, you become self-sufficient. You start to rest and trust in yourself and not in the Lord. You, you're not going needy. It's like, Lord, speak to me. Tell me something new. And in that sense, there's, a, there's kind of a crazy thing that goes on here. And, and it took me a long time to see this in Martha's life. Martha's saying that she needs help, but she actually wearied herself. She was so busy and so consumed with herself that what she was doing became a burden to her. That's why it was painful for her. Because she was so consumed with getting it done herself that she forgot it wasn't all on her. She didn't even stop to actually pray. She didn't, we find no record that she went to Mary and asked Mary, hey, Mary, do you think you could help me with this? Maybe we can fellowship a little bit while we're finishing up the meal. What we find is her complaining. In other words, she stored those things up in her heart, and eventually they spilled out because she wasn't sitting at the feet of Jesus like Mary is going to do. She's, she's busy doing all this stuff, and she becomes overwhelmed by her own activity. And man, I have lived this out. Oh, the stories that Connie can tell you. You can ask her. She can just share with you all the, you know, the times when you just worry and fret and you concern yourself. And then you realize, oh, that's right. I forgot to sit at the feet of Jesus today. I had a great plan for how I was going to fail. I see some of you have done that. You know, you worry yourself into a frenzy and you realize you haven't actually talked to God about it. You didn't sit at the feet of Jesus. Whenever we criticize others, we pity ourselves. We feel like we're overworked. I'm going to tell you, it's time to examine your own life. It's, are you spending enough time at the feet of Jesus? And perhaps, perhaps in all of that busy work, instead of being grafted into the vine, here's the cool thing about the vine. If you're grafted into the vine, you don't need to do a thing but be a healthy branch. Amen? You'll bear fruit automatically. That's what will happen because you're, you're part of the vine. You don't see grapevines out there, you know, jockeying for position, bashing each other around, you know, trashing each other. It's like, you rotten, lazy vine. Why don't you get on another part of the trellis? doesn't happen. The natural outgrowth of you being grafted into the vine and resting and trusting in Jesus is you're going to bear fruit. You'll be productive because you're going to have what you need and you're going to produce what you're supposed to produce. The Lord will see to that. It's a beautiful picture that we have there in John 15. Look, and if we're in him, we abide in him, we just stay with Jesus. 
We, we set up our dwelling place in him. You're going to bear fruit. And notice it says, or in John 15, 5, apart from him, apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing anyway. So I would say it's, it's a good thing to sit at the feet of Jesus and wait for him to work in our lives. Martha's problem wasn't that she had too much work to do. That she allowed her work to distract her from sitting at the feet of Jesus. It isn't that she was totally overwhelmed. She just allowed it to distract her to where she no longer sat at the feet. And, and in that, she was serving two masters. That's what happened. You got the master of the work side. It's like, you still got stuff to do. And Jesus is saying, what I'd like you to do is come sit down with Mary and sit at my feet. And then maybe I'll send a few people to come help you with that stuff. It boils down to three things. You see, if serving Christ makes us difficult to live with, if it makes us ornery, maybe we need to adjust a few things like our priorities. Maybe we need to adjust our priorities. Maybe the Lord is no longer first. Maybe he's second or third or fifth or tenth. But maybe just adjust your priorities a little bit. Perhaps it's a perspective issue. You see, a perspective is your viewpoint, right? When we say perspective, like when you go out on a, you know, you go around on PV and you go out to, you know, maybe Point Furman or you're, you're out there someplace and you're standing on the coast, your perspective then is you're above the ocean looking out over the ocean and you can see everything that's happening out there in the channel between there and Catalina, right? Your perspective is there. But when you're down in the water, you don't have that same perspective, right? You're like, help, I'm drowning. You can see everything when you're up on that bluff looking out. But you cannot see the same thing when you're in the water. The only thing that can help you get that perspective is you get out of the situation that you're currently in and you go someplace to where you can see more clearly. In other words, you get that divine viewpoint. You go to where the Lord is. You get his view of things. Sometimes we just need to adjust our viewpoint. That's our perspective. And sometimes it's a performance issue. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin, right? So sometimes it's just a performance issue. Look, we already know, and, and I sometimes wonder if Martha already had this conversation, because Jesus kind of calls her out a little bit here. Maybe she was known as somebody who kind of needed to have her performance adjusted a little bit. You got to put it into practice. When Jesus says, sit at his feet, you know, <laughs> people come to me all the time and they'll say, you know, my life's a mess. And I'll ask them, well, how's your devotional life? Well, I don't have time. <laughs> you just identified the problem. You identified the problem. That, that's a priority issue. That's a perspective issue. And it will turn into a performance issue. Only you can do something about that. Got to take time to sit at the feet of Jesus. Some interesting things about Mary of Bethany. Every time we see her in Scripture, she's at the same place. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, some people will say, wow, well, you know, she's no earthly good. She's heavenly minded, all right, but she's no earthly good. But she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She sat and listened to his word. She fell at his feet, shared her woes, her concerns. And then she came to his feet and poured out her worship on them. So every time we find her, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, I want you to notice something in those three passages, Luke 10, John 11, John 12. In those three passages, they're not the same situation. They're very different situations. And yet every situation we find her at the feet of Jesus first. And the crazy thing in all those situations, we don't find that she failed in any one of those. We don't, we don't find her being a complete failure in life. 
It's not like sitting at the feet of Jesus caused her to be less than she was set out to be by the Lord. And in fact, it enhanced her relationship with God and with others to the point that, that she could share her woes and she could share her worship and she could share in the word that the Lord was speaking to her. And so Mary and Martha sometimes are contrast, and I think wrongly. I, I don't think they're opposites in that sense. I think they're complementary. I, I believe that we need to be a little bit of a worker and a whole lot of a worshiper. I think the Lord has put within us a, a great desire to accomplish wonderful things. She sat at his feet. She fell at his feet. She came to his feet. She was at the feet of Jesus. And each time, it's kind of crazy when you look at these, these stories, there was some kind of fragrance associated with the whole thing, too. So she's sitting at Jesus' feet and kneeling at Jesus' feet, and she's worshiping at Jesus' feet. There, there's something that happens. There's something that comes from it. I think our personalities, I think our gifts are different. And God knows that. But there's one common thing we need to do. We need to spend time sitting at the feet of Jesus. Don't miss this. You know, it doesn't do you any good. You know, it's always kind of crazy. I've shared with people many times. You know, I used to travel around with Pastor Chuck, and we'd be going to our various facilities and doing all kinds of things. It was actually laughable. And, and if Chuck could have, you know, I mean, he, he held it in pretty well. But there are times when, when he would, you know, speak to me or somebody who's been around him a lot and says, did you see all those people come out of nowhere to start working when I got here? And they would. They'd find out there'd be like a Chuck alert at one of our conferences. Pastor Chuck's on grounds, you know? And so what would happen is all of a sudden, people who were not doing a thing 15 minutes before he got there, we'd go grab shovels and they'd, you know, they'd be out there digging holes that didn't even need to be dug and all kinds of crazy stuff. They would, they would, they would be trying to work for him instead of with him. And the same is true for the Lord. Sometimes people get busy serving. They, they get engaged in doing things, but they haven't sat down at the feet of Jesus and figured out what this is all about yet. So get the first thing first. Martha's situation, she received Jesus into her home and then neglected the very person that she received into her home. That's the crazy thing. That's what being a, a, a workaholic can do, even if it's a ministry workaholic. I've, I've talked to people who, they're very gifted people, but nobody wants to be around them. Nobody wants to be anywhere near them because they're always seemingly irritated with the people that they're supposed to try and bless. You, know, you really don't want children's ministry people that, that hate children. It's, it's not a great recipe for success. These rotten, stinking kids. Did you know that kids make diapers? <laughs> well, yeah, that's what they do. We're supposed to be lovers of men's souls, and you learn to do that by sitting at the feet of Jesus. You don't learn that by picking and choosing the things that you want to do in ministry. Ministry's dirty sometimes. You need to be a lover of people. It's not what we do for the Lord. It's what we do with the Lord that matters. It's a matter of balance. Martha felt neglected after Mary left the kitchen, I'm imagining. But when you really think about it, Mary actually did care. It wasn't like, it wasn't like she was abandoning her. Just, well, I'm not going to be your sister anymore. Didn't happen. She just knew that she had a, a rare opportunity to sit down and be still and listen to, to the Lord. And she seized it. You, you look, need to learn to be wise to that reality in your life because there's a, a great place for both our duty and our devotion to cohabitate within our lives. And the Lord can, can do both those things. And it's so important that you learn that balance because the Lord really does love doers too. But he loves doers that do things with the right heart. 
because it brings him glory and honor and praise, not doers that get things done at the expense of others. Busy in that sense is not necessarily blessed. If you're going to be a worker, you need to first be a worshiper if you're going to be a worker in the kingdom. And so, make sure that we understand that what we do with Christ is the most important thing, not for him, but with him. Those things that we can say, we actually have the heart of God in this. We know what it's like to sit down at the feet of Jesus and just spend some time with, with him that your devotional life pours over into your work life. Because here's what happens when you do that. If you'll allow that devotional love for the Lord to affect your life, it will affect your work life. You'll become more gentle and kind and tender. You'll also become more productive and wise. You'll learn to exercise discernment. You'll save yourself all kinds of time. I often wonder exactly how quickly those tasks that Martha had to get done would have gotten done had she actually sat at the feet of Jesus and sought his face and said, what's important? You see, the Lord wasn't looking for a five-course meal. He probably would have been just fine with a sandwich. But she was so convinced of her own path without seeking his will that she created some of the very work that she was complaining about. Don't create work for yourself by not sitting at the feet of Jesus. Because it's pretty crazy what you can get yourself into that the Lord will eventually have to get you out of. You have to be careful not to be too much like Martha, busy but not blessed. But we do need to be like the 70 in this chapter. And if you read back through and reread this entire chapter, the 70 were sent out. And in that sense, we're ambassadors for the Lord. You can't be a good ambassador if you don't represent the one who sent you. Jesus loves people and cares about them deeply. He's concerned with everything in their life, including their workload. But he has a right priority in all things. Like the, like the Good Samaritan, we are neighbors to everybody, including our family, our spouses, our children. You know, sometimes we, we pull these relationships that Scripture talks about as the body of Christ, we, we yank them out and say, okay, well, because this person is my wife or my husband, that these things don't apply. Or this is my son or my daughter, and so I, I don't have to be gentle and kind and peaceable uh, I, I, you know, because I'm dad, I could do whatever I want. No, that's not what it says. Matter of fact, your kids are also your brothers and sisters in Christ if they love the Lord. They're also your neighbors. So everything that's in here applies to everyone. And so like the good Samaritan, we should be good neighbors. You get that from sitting at the feet of Jesus. And like the sisters, we need to be good worshipers. And so I pray that if you came in and you were a little leaning towards the Martha side, be a good time to get some adjustment and maybe get over there towards the Mary side of sitting at the feet of Jesus. And maybe you're one of those people that doesn't find any real use for getting anything actually done. And you sit so far on the merry side that you don't bother to actually realize we're supposed to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. And so maybe you need to come back a little bit the other way. But in all of this, please take time to sit at the feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And have the worship team come back up. And also have the, the guys come forward, the pastors come forward and be available for prayer. Maybe, maybe you got a little struggle going on, uh, a little tension between these two sisters. Maybe there's a little too much of one and not enough of the other. Maybe you lean fully to one and you have none of the other. Maybe you're just right and you know somebody that needs prayer. If you need prayer tonight, um, the pastors are going to be up front to, to be able to pray with you. Take time to make Jesus your top priority. Get into that vertical mode to where 
you can honestly say that you, you have the Lord's heart in things. And so that what you're doing for the Lord is because you spent time with the Lord. And that the work that you do flows out of the worship that's in your heart. That your duties that you undertake is because your devotion is supreme. And get those things balanced out in your life. It's so wonderful. It's so important for us to, to have that joy and that freedom of having that kind of balance. Blessed is the one, blessed is the man, the woman whose sins are forgiven. They're not removed. So we, we, we are blessed in that sense. But we can be additionally blessed when we have a right heart and when that joy that is the strength of the Lord that, that comes to us comes because we're close to him. We love him and he loves us and that love flows out of us then in all that we do and say. And so as we begin to worship, we're just going to do a couple of songs and then I'm going to come back up and close in prayer. But if you need prayer, come on forward, be prayed for. Let the Lord shift whichever way you need to go. If you're a Martha towards Mary, if you're a Mary towards Martha. Amen.